I think there are a lot of reasons why this conversation is a necessary conversation. Um, I think for many of us, we are probably here for three reasons. One reason might be uh, you just want to figure this out so you can be helpful, so that you can love people as best as you can. Others of us might be in this place of, I don't really know what to believe. I don't really know where I'm at. I identify as Christian, but I feel like some of my views might not be as conservative as Christians would expect because I don't know where I am. So I'm just here in an attempt to figure it out. Others of us might be here because this topic on sexuality is one that you understand inherently. It's something that you struggle with, and by struggle, I mean that there is a resistance at hand. And so you feel like maybe I can just come to this session so I can have another reason to fight. Um, today, we're supposed to talk about sexuality and identity. Um, I'm going to be talking about sexuality in a general sense, but very specifically, I'm going to be speaking about homosexuality for the most part. I think um, there are some biblical reasons that aren't necessarily subjective as to why this conversation is necessary. I think the first biblical reason is that Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 28 to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, teaching them all that I commanded you. I think this is a conversation that we need to have if we want to be good teachers. The second reason I think that this is a necessary conversation because in Jude 1, Jude tells uh, the saints of God that he was writing to, he said, hey, I intended to write to you about our common salvation, but I found it necessary to appeal to you to contend for the faith. What is the faith? All that the scriptures have to say about God and sin and Jesus. So I think that this is a necessary conversation so that we are equipped to contend. The third reason I think that this is a necessary conversation is for the sake of discernment. Um, in Ephesians 5, it says, walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right. She hear my voice, so she, that's what that is. I'm sorry, child. Um, she heard it for like 10 months, you know. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. I think understanding uh, a biblical or having a biblical view of sexuality allows us to discern what is good. What should I approve? What should not approve? What should I affirm? What should not affirm? How should I teach? How should not? Like this is a way of us basically equipping ourselves to be able to think rightly about these things. One element I think that I, I add to this conversation is experience. I used to be a lesbian. Even that sentence is offensive in most circles. To, to say used to or to reference lesbianism in the past tense sounds bigoted, sounds even delusional, as if I'm saying something that isn't actually true, even though 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 says the same thing. But for me, I was raised in this um, single parent household. My mother loved me well. My daddy loved me sometimes. Um, growing up, I had um, gender confusion. I had um, discovered, I don't know, kindergarten, first, second grade, that I felt this pull towards the other girls in my class. The same way that kindergartners, first graders, second graders, I don't know, those people, the same way you feel like, oh, I want that to be my boyfriend. I felt the same thing about girls, wanting that to be my girlfriend. I didn't have a label for it, though, because this is early 90s, you know. It wasn't as popular, per se, for me to watch MTV, grab a term, and apply it to my identity. So I didn't know what it was until I went to church. And when I went to church, then I heard uh, how I felt described in terms of being abominable. Now, the problem wasn't that they called it abominable because that's Bible. It was the way they said it. The way they said it was like, oh, so I obviously shouldn't tell nobody about this one because y'all <laughs> not going to like me too much. And I'm six, concluding that Christians don't like people that feel how I feel. And so... I kept it a secret, didn't know what to do with it, just like, hey, I'm going to just, you know, keep this under wraps, whatever, whatever, until I went to high school. Most people either turn up in high school or college. I chose high school. High school, and I was like, you know what, I'm just tired of acting straight. It seems like it's more work to act straight than it would be to just be myself. And so I got on MySpace, that's when it was popping at the time. 
I don't know if any of us remember Tom. I'm, I, I'm sure he's working for Facebook or somebody or Snapchat because they on their way down too. But <laughs> I got on MySpace, uh, got into a relationship with uh, this girl that I met on MySpace. And in that time is when I transitioned into being a stud. And the black lesbian community, a stud is the woman who projects a hyper-masculine self. So I sagged, I wore boxers, I wore, um, what do you call those, sports bras to flatten down my chest. Um, at that time, I had straight hair, so I would just put my hair in a ponytail. I walked as masculine as I could. I talked very masculine. I sat very masculine. And I felt like I was being me it wasn't like I was trying to be male it was I was being my most natural self or so I thought until I was 19 and it was 2008 and I wasn't looking for God God seemed very inconvenient to me uh, holiness did not seem fun. I was so cool on being one of those people that only listen to uh, uh, Christian music and wear skirts to their ankles because I thought that's what Christianity was. I, I just didn't want to do that. I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, it didn't seem fun to love Jesus. Probably because most of the Christians I saw, they made the faith look begrudging. <laughs> it's like, why none of y'all look happy? But y'all serve the God of joy. That's really confusing to me. But in 2008, I was in my room, um, and I felt God speak to me in such a way where everything that he said about sin and himself was no longer theory for me. Um, it wasn't theoretical that he would judge sin. It wasn't theoretical that he was holy. It was like, no, this is an actual thing. This is... This is reality, and it wasn't just that my sexuality is the one thing that God had beef with. God showed me that I was holistically in need of him, that every single thing that I loved and enjoyed and had an affection for was everything that he would judge me for because nothing that I did and nothing that I loved had to do with him. And I think what that did is that put me in a position of impulsive repentance, because when you realize that there is nothing you can do to make yourself right with God and that there is nothing that you can do to deserve this mercy you are getting from God, what other thing can I do but to believe? When I saw that Jesus really had to be the only alternative to everything that I loved and enjoyed, I chose him. And it wasn't me choosing him. It was 2 Corinthians 4 where the God who said, let there be light showed in my heart to give the light of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Where I was able to finally see that Jesus was everything that I had been looking for in created things. And so I share that because testimonies are useful. Testimonies are powerful, but they are not ultimately authoritative. So we got to get to the scriptures, right? I think... Um, one thing that I wanted to emphasize and like to emphasize in testimonies and what I will emphasize in this talk is that I think memoirs and people, they share their testimonies. You could walk away feeling like, oh, yeah, look at them. They chose God, um, <laughs> which is cool, but it's not because the emphasis is God. It's God who made me. It's God who drew me. It's God who who saved me. It's God who's keeping me. God is to blame for my being his. And so far too often, I think in talking to people about sexuality or talking about sexuality, a lot of times we can get to a lot of morality without God. And when you leave God out of the equation, what happens to your evangelism is that your evangelism automatically has no more power. Because Romans 1.16 says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. If you know anything about the gospel, you recognize that the gospel is less about you and more about what God did to get God glory. And this topic by itself, if you leave God out of the equation, disregard evangelism, if this topic... It's not rooted in what God has to say about it. What will happen is it will ultimately begin to be defined on your terms, where sexuality is what you think it is. Male, male, female, female, it's all good according to my own subjective opinions. Why? Because if God doesn't have authority, you're going to give yourself that. So the first point that I want to say or talk about when it comes to sexuality is God. 
If you ever read the Bible before, I don't want to assume we have, but if you ever read it, the whole thing is about him. Sexuality makes no sense apart from God because sexuality doesn't exist apart from God. If you have your Bibles, can we turn to Genesis 1? It's the first book. Shouldn't take you long. We don't use Bibles with paper anymore anyway. We just click. Praise God. Look at you. I'm kind of setting you up because I'm going to say like five words of the Bible, but that's fine. We need to look at it anyway. The Bible reveals God to us. Um, in it, we, we learn about him, we get to know him, and we even learn about ourselves. Genesis 1 tells us uh, who God is, and it tells us what God has done. It says, in the beginning, God created Paul's. I love, as a creative, that the first thing that the Bible wants to tell us about God is that he's the creator. They could have said that he's Lord. They could have said that he's sovereign. They could have said that he's Alpha and Omega, but I think all of these fall under the category of being the creator God. Because if you didn't create nothing, then you don't have authority over nothing. But the thing about God is, because he is a creator, he has authority. If I made this pulpit here, if I did, I probably would have made it black because I like that color. Wakanda forever. But I'm not being racist. <laughs> you know, people tweeting, oh my God, what's wrong with white? Um, <laughs> the thing with this, this pulpit, if I made this pulpit, I determined its color, I determined its height, I de determined how, uh, if, it, if it should have four nails or two nails, I determ determined if it should be movable or immovable. I determined how it should be used because I created it, thus I have th authority over its function. The thing that we miss in this conversation a lot is that if God is the creator God, then he defines how his creation should behave. So at the very basic level of the question or the very basic level of this conversation when asked, why is homosexuality wrong? The very simple answer is because God said so. And we don't like that. We don't like the fact that God could be so authoritative as to tell me that he, that he has the right to decide what I can and cannot do. But we know by now that God is an authoritative God, and I don't even think we want to serve a God who we have more authority than. <sighs> I think it's not good to us, or what we think is not good to us, is uh, for God to not be authoritative. I think we have to define, actually, what good actually means. Because really... A lot of our questions fall back to what is good or not. Is it, is it, is it a good thing for my um, sister to have a partner? Is it a good thing for me to attend my brother's gay wedding? Is it a good thing for me to like my friend's picture on Instagram that's super like lesbian or something? And I'm really like frank, and so I'm not trying to be uh, insensitive. I'm just saying how all of us think. Is, is, it, is it a good thing or not? The word good comes up 14 times between Genesis 1 and Genesis 3. The first time is in Genesis 1, verse 10. It says, God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was what, saints? Another way to read that text is God judged that it was good. I think that's interesting, that God is not only creator, but he is also judge. The judge of goodness and thus the judge of wickedness. God defines goodness on his terms. He looks at the creation and says, oh, I think this is a good thing not only for my glory, but for the good of the people that I'm creating to inhabit it. Do you know who the second person in Genesis is to say the word good? The devil. In Genesis 1 through 2, God creates and calls the things that he creates good and he defines good but then the devil comes along and he uses the concept of goodness only to tempt Eve to sin he says for God knows 
that when you eat of it, the day, that your eyes will be open and you will be like who? The authoritative, creative God knowing good and evil. Who is God? God is creative. God is eternal. God is all-knowing. But she, he says that she will be like him, that she, a created being, could be the one who was the creator and that she could have the authority that he has, which includes an understanding of goodness. What am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is, is that when sin entered into, into the world, we were convinced that we have the authority to define what is good and what isn't. This is in us. So, now that we talked about God, let's talk about us. Genesis 127. Can somebody read Genesis 127 for me? Let's act like we in church, even though I'm not a pastor. You got a deep voice. Genesis 127, God makes male and female in his image. Us being image bearers means three things, or a few things, but it means three things, that we are made like God. So like God, we are communal beings. God is a triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He has always been in a community. We, too, are people who function in families, function in friendship, function in marriage, function in church. We are communal beings. We also think. We can make rational decisions. We don't run off of instinct. We are also creative. If you like to cook, uh, you are creating something from nothing and calling it good. That's if you know how to cook. I shouldn't have said like to cook. So we are like God in that way. Another reason that we, are, another thing about being made in the image of God is that we are valuable to God. Genesis 9, when God is talking to Mo Noah, he says, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. When you fast forward to James 3, when he's talking about taming the tongue, he says, with it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. The value of human life is so high that human beings will be judged based on their treatment of human beings, because the implication is, God might be saying, what is it that you think about me that you think you have the right to talk about or kill or treat somebody made in my image like they're made in the image of Satan. The other thing is we are also made for God. Colossians 1.16 says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. Isaiah 43.7, Everyone who was called by my name, who I created for my glory. The thing about being made in the image of God is that your bearing his image gives you a signpost of who you were made for. So if that is the case then all of my sexual impulses I have to reckon with, am I using it for glory or not? But I think the other practical step is, if all people are valuable to God, then even in my understanding of sexuality, I need to be very careful about how I speak to people who he loves. We talked about God, we talked about us, now let's talk about sex. Back in Genesis, uh, God makes stuff. He calls it good. Then he says, hey, let's make man in our image and in our likeness. So after he, after he says that, he makes Adam out of some dirt, blows into his mouth, which I, I just would love to see that scene. It had to be interesting. Blows in his mouth so he comes alive, uh, gives Adam all this dominion, tells him to start naming all the animals. So Adam starts naming all the animals because he got dominion. And I'm sure it got to throw Adam off a little bit that while he's naming the animals, all the animals are coming in pairs. He sees that, you know, the giraffe got a bay. <laughs> the monkey got a boo, you know. Uh, maybe some roaches was the need and I don't know because I'm not the judge of good. God is, you know. Uh, so he's seeing these animals and these insects and they all have a counterpart except him. Then God says that that's not a good thing. 
He defines it. He says that he needs a counterpart. He needs a helper. And I've always been intrigued by how God has given Adam all of this authority, yet he did not give Adam the option on who his helper should be. He did not ask Adam for his suggestions on who his counterpart would be. God makes an authoritative executive decision as to who should be with Adam, and it's a woman. God takes a, a rib out of Adam's side with no barbecue sauce on it, which is nasty. That's, you know how some people like dry rub? I think that's the weirdest thing in my life. Um, that's ice of Jesus. Um, He takes the rib out, makes a woman. Adam continues in his uh, authority by naming the woman. He calls her woman because she came out of man. And God, through Moses, says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother. And that's funny that Moses would say that because Adam and Eve don't have a daddy and a mama. So obviously Moses or God through Moses is saying that what I am establishing here is a universal context and format that should exist throughout time. But sex is not brought up in the scriptures until marriage is created as if to show us that sex always has a context. Sex is never to be discussed apart from marriage as if it is its own entity. God made sex. I wish I heard that growing up in church more often because truth be told, most of us, I'm not going to say most, me, (laughs) my standard from sex came from the world teaching it to me because the church, I guess, was afraid that if they taught me about sex, I would go out and do it, not reckoning that I'm already born in sin and shaped in iniquity and perhaps I'm going to do it anyway unless you give me a greater standard to attend to. If anybody read Song of Solomon, it's clear, God. Song of Solomon is nasty, I'm sorry. (laughs) It's talking about raisins and drinking things off your chest. It's uncomfortable. I know they start saying this about the gospel, but it's uncomfortable. I don't even want to think of Jesus in those terms. (laughs) But (laughs) <laughs> that gave me a headache thinking about that. God's, God's vision for marriage and sex in some sense goes beyond our own pleasure. It is pleasurable or God wouldn't allow our bodies to function in such a way where we can experience it. If it was solely utilitarian or solely for pro- procreative purposes, sex would be the same as a high five. And I won't take that metaphor farther than I already have. because, yeah. But... God's vision for marriage has everything to do with his gospel. Ephesians 5, 31 through 32, Paul piggybacks off of Moses and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall be one, become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and his church. This is why it's a good thing for us to get this deep in our hearts that marriage is defined by God too. Marriage was created by God before the fall even happened. Marriage is not a product of our sinfulness. Marriage was not created by people. Marriage was created by God to show off his gospel. And so if we love the gospel, then we recognize how high marriage must be esteemed in our hearts. Another thing to note is that the main tools used to engage in sex is the body. And who made the body? Who made our hands? Who made our eyes? Who made our mind? Who made our private parts? What we do to our bodies and what we do with our bodies matters to God. Why? Because 1 Corinthians 6.13 says that the body is not meant for purpose. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for who? For the Lord. We might have this body, but we don't own it. It's not ours. So even though we feel like we have the autonomy to do as we please, even this he has authority over. The reason it's difficult to to grasp that, because it feels 
Ah. I think when you're in the flesh, hearing anybody, hearing anything about anybody having control over you doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel good. And I think that's because of sin. In Genesis 3, let's read it, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. I love that made thing. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. This narrative is intriguing. Intriguing because the first thing that Satan does, first of all, he's rude because he didn't even say hello. He just starts asking questions. She should have been like, you're rude. You can't be pure. Um, <laughs> Satan, the first thing he does is he casts doubt on the word of God. In verse 1, he says, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? The Bible says that the serpent is crafty. A crafty person is a person who has deceptive motives, but to you, it can come off like they're being very sincere. I'm pretty sure the devil and the body of this snake sounded like he had Eve's best interest in mind. Or she probably would have read through him if she saw that he was this evil person. So when he asked, did God actually say, in her mind, she might think, oh, I have a friend that wants to talk to us about theology with me. She's not realizing that if he can cause her to question the word of God, the only proper response to that when deceived is that she will question the person of God. How you think about sexuality now because of Eve and Adam has everything to do with what you believe about the word of God. Did God really say in 1 Corinthians 9 through 10 that those who practice sexual immorality or men who practice homosexuality will not inherit the kingdom of God? Or did God really say that those who believe in his name will be given eternal life? Did God really say in 1 Thessalonians that this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you are to flee sexual immorality? But also did God really say in Isaiah 53, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. Satan wants to cast doubt on your hope and your sin. Sin. Because if he can cast doubt on your sin, then you don't even want the hope that's offered. For the time is coming when people will not endure, sit with, sit under, listen to, suffer with sound teaching, healthy teaching, good teaching, right teaching accurate teaching but they will have ears where they will accumulate for themselves teachers meaning that there are options there are plenty of podcasts there are plenty of pastors that there are plenty of books that there are plenty of uh, of people who will suit their own passions the thing about this text is it says that those people who accumulate false teaching the issue is first a heart issue before it is a hermeneutical issue. They have passions that are not in alignment with the scriptures. And so what they do is they find people to match up with their passions, even if it means judgment. So the question can't just be, how do we teach people to read the scriptures? Because that's what we need to do. But it's also we need to challenge people why they want to read the scriptures the way they are. What is it in you that you don't want God to be right in what he has to say about sexuality? Is it an authority issue? Is it a freedom issue? Is that you just, you just think that people should do what they, they want to do? Do you get what I'm saying? There's a deeper motive behind people's interpretation of texts. 
the temptation of our day is also like Eve to let experience trump authority. I had a conversation with a young lady at a um, conference I was at, and she, um, I had laid out some texts, Romans 1, 1 Corinthians, Genesis 1 through 3, et cetera. And she asked me if I knew this guy. Um, it's a guy, he's a popular communicator. He's, he's gay, married, et cetera. And she said, did I know him? And I said, no. And she said, well, I know him. I used to work with him. Do you, and he's a professing believer. Do you believe that he will go to hell? And I said, well, according to 1 John, those who have been born of God cannot continue in sin. And so I think what the scriptures would say, if he isn't living a fruitful a life based on the fruits of repentance, then yes. And she said, well, I know him and he's really loving and he's really kind. And I don't think that's true. It grieved me because she didn't even know that she was disregarding all that God said because of her experience with her friend. Because her friend to her was loving, her friend to her was kind, which all human beings are in many ways, but anything not done from faith is sin. Because her friend was all of these things, she didn't care what God had to say. But when you're talking to people and you see their love for each other, and you see their affection for each other and you understand how close they are and the oneness that exists. It feels cruel to say this is wrong. It feels cruel to say y'all shouldn't be together. It feels ruthless to, to, to tell that these women that they should not be in love. But the thing is, if God is the greatest thing on earth, then I have to be willing to hurt your feelings so that you have eternal life here and now. If God is the greatest thing on earth, then I have to be willing to suffer and to be perceived as bigoted if that means that we will be together in glory. I get the tension, but I think the tension would be at ease if we thought about glory more often than we thought about our comfort. The second problem, I am really over time. Y'all gonna have to let me keep going. The second thing is that in verse six, she says that it's a good thing and that it was a delight to the eyes. I think my first observation would be how is something that's gonna kill you delightful? It shows you how irrational sin makes us. An important thing to know is that Eve was not all the way off in her assessment of the tree when she said it was good for food and delightful to the eyes. Because in Genesis 2.9, it says that the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow in the ground and trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And so God did make it good for food and God did make it uh, pleasing to the eye. And I think that is an encouragement because both men and women have desirable things about them. For me, I was attracted to women, one, because they were beautiful, two, because they were comfortable. They're soft, you know, men got a lot of muscle, some men uh, got a lot of muscle, you know. <laughs> that wasn't my thing. I liked how women looked. I liked how women smell. I liked their voice. I liked their face. I liked their heart. I liked the, just men and women are completely different beings, and all that a woman was, all that I saw were good things. A woman's beauty is a good thing. The problem is when their beauty is more beautiful to me than God's. And that's what idolatry is. Is that in my thinking that I am being wise of my assessment, I exchange the glory of the created one for created things. Eve's problem wasn't her assessment, but the idolatry that fueled it. She had an overestimation of the goodness of the tree where she reckoned that this tree being good for food meant she thought that this tree could be more satisfying to the body than God could. How does that relate to sexuality today? That somehow the things that God has made can be, make me more whole in my body than the one that made it. She thought that the tree was more desirable to the eyes. This woman is in a sinless place. She ain't got contacts. She ain't got glasses. She walks with God with no disruption in their unity, but now she looks at the one thing that is off limits and thinks that's the most beautiful thing. 
What is it about doubt that it messes with our sight? She also, the thing is, for those who are attracted to the same sex, there are legitimate observations that can be made about the same sex to which we are fond of. But just like God told Eve, it might be good, but that doesn't mean it's meant for our consumption. The third thing is that she said it was desired to make one wise. Eve had an affection for the tree. This desired is what we see in the New Testament translated as passions. It's a lust. It's a covetousness. This, she wants this tree. Do you think she made it up? Could it be that this desire might have, the impulse might have been out of her control? Maybe not. But the desire is a real one. But the question is, did the legitimacy of the desire make it morally acceptable to submit to? To say it another way, did the presence of an affection make it justifiable to listen to? If God said, don't touch it, even in the presence of temptation, we have to be willing, that, willing to believe that disobedience is not the best way to receive pleasure. But that, even in the presence of temptation, I have to believe that God is right. And the same to all who are tempted with sexual sin, we might feel like it's good to pursue, but just because it feels good doesn't mean it is. But our bend is to assume the opposite. This is the beginning of mankind's propensity to determine goodness not by faith, but by affection. We choose sin because we love it. Don't nobody sin because they don't want to. Ain't nobody held nothing, no gun to our head and say lie to that person. We lie because we want to. I don't want to get a whooping, so I'm finna say I didn't curse that person out, mama. We do it because there is a real desire to do so. We are born in sin and loving it. John 3.19 says, and this is the judgment, that light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Romans 1, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their woman exchange natural relations for those that are contrary to nature and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another Ephesians 2 and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air the spirit that is now at work and the sons of disobedience amongst we all once lived in the passions of our flesh people sin because they want to there is a affection that is legitimate and this affection has led us and will lead us to death every time but it's the sin in us that makes us believe that because we feel it we have no choice but to do it but just because the feeling exists doesn't mean that it's worthy to be obeyed I think can I have seven minutes Morgan where's Morgan Where's the apostle? I got seven minutes, apostle. Because you know, black people, we, we say that the spirit is leading us to go over time. <laughs> He's not a God of order right now. That's what we say. I just, before we close, I just want to talk about sexual orientation because I believe that belongs here. Sexual orientation describes patterns of emotional, romantic, and sexual attraction and one sense of personal and social identity based on those attractions. The two terms used most in, uh, for categories describing sexual orientation are heterosexual and homosexual. I believe the creation, and I say creation on purpose, of these categories assist us in some ways, but I think that they have been unhelpful in a general sense. This is why. In the definition, it says that sexual orientation describes patterns of emotional, romantic, and sexual attraction and one's sense of personal and social identity. Sexual orientation for us has become the way we choose to identify ourselves. We've concluded that if this is how you feel, then this is who you are. These categories 
I said that they were created because they've only existed for a little over a century. 1868 is the first time the terms homosexual and heterosexual were used. They were created by a Hungarian journalist named Carl. I ain't gonna say his last name because it's Hungarian and I'm black. <laughs> and even then they didn't begin to influence the general public into the 1930s. When I learned this, I thought to myself, well, First Corinthians uses the term homosexual. Well, if you look at the King James Version, which was in 1611, way before 1868, it doesn't use the term homosexual because it didn't exist. Neither does the term heterosexual exist. That's why you never seen it in the Bible. But modern translations, when the word popped up, they said, okay, arsenokotai, which is what the, the Greek that Paul is using, homosexual seems to be the closest term to match that, so let's put that in our translation. Am I saying they're wrong? No. But what I am saying is that when you look at the Greek of how Paul describes men practicing homosexuality in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, the Greek is saying a male in a bed. He uses the identity category of gender, not orientation which was typical pre-20th century. Before then, people did not think of themselves in the categories that we do. Your sexuality was assumed according to your gender. If you asked a man in 1850, are you straight or gay, he would look at you like you were crazy. He would say, I'm a, I'm a man. I don't know what you mean by that. Your sexuality or your sexual feelings and attractions were thought of in terms of sin and virtue. But to us now, they are thought of in terms of human identity that is either fixed or fluid. Janelle Williams Paris, who wrote this book, you should get it, called The End of Sexual Identity, said this. The major problem with sexual identity in general is that it is a social construct that provides a faulty pattern for understanding what it means to be human linking desire to identity, implying that what you want, sexually speaking, is who you are. But according to Genesis 1, who you are is an image bearer. In Genesis 3, who you've become is a sinner. And because of this, what you do is sin. And I say this because how we have historically understood orientation and sexual identity has impacted how we understand sin and people, which in turn has impacted our evangelism, our sanctification, and our discipleship. If someone's sexuality, their being gay, is the primary way you identify them as a person, guess what? Your evangelism will completely center around their sexuality instead of the whole person. And that's the problem. I have people come up to me all the time. Hey, Jackie, I need help with my gay friend. First of all, what's their name? <laughs> the fact that you introduce me to you introduce them to me as the gay friend as if they don't have so much more to them than that as if the entire person is centered around who they like and who they love. And I think this is what the concept of orientation has done to us. Because we have whittled people down into being mainly their sexuality instead of being image bearers of the living God who we should minister to on that level. Also, if your sexuality as a, as a person is the primary lens by which you understand yourself, then your temptations will always have more power over you than they deserve. When the world says, or when you become a believer, and the temptations still exist, and they come up in your heart, come up in your mind, come up in your dreams, what the temptation will tell you is, that's just who you are, bro. That's who you were made to be. You're just suppressing your truest self. When our temptations of sexual proclivities become our identity, we give it more power than it deserves. So what are we to do? I'm not saying we are to disregard these categories because, I mean, I think they're helpful. If someone comes up to me and says, hey, my friend needs help, I'm going to say, what does your friend need help with? We have to get to a point of specificity, I think that's how you say it, uh, to get to the point of ministry. But I think if we got back to viewing ourselves and each other's as the scriptures describe us, I think it would be more, a lot more helpful. Even for parents. I get so many parents that are so grieved that their children 
are same-sex attracted. My son, he says that he's feeling same-sex attracted. Jackie, I don't know what to do because he said he is same-sex attracted because he has been tempted. You have concluded that that is all that he is. Yet, nobody comes to me ever saying, oh, Jackie, my son said that he looked at a young girl's butt. I don't really know what to do. Why? Because you don't see his heterosexuality as something that is sexually immoral too. You have assumed that that's just a boy thing. You're just, you're just being a boy, son. Now, should you have self-control? Yes. But you're just being, you're not overwhelmed because you recognize that this is a temptation that is a part of our, his identity as a sinner. So what if on this side, when our children come to us and say, hey, I am struggling with this temptation, instead of you saying, I think my son is gay, you remind your son that, son, all of us are broken. All of us have a sexuality that is not fully right. Heteronormative lust is just as abominable to God as hetero homosexual lust. All of it needs Jesus. And so, to close, how I'll end is saying this. The presence of these affections, instead of letting it define us, it should point us upwards. What I mean by that is, if anything, the presence of same-sex affections proves that God was right when he said that we were born in sin. It proves that the scriptures are accurate in its assessment of our hearts and how dark they actually is. So instead of listening to the world, the world will say, because it exists, that's what you should do. We should say, because it exists, this is who I need. Yeah. The presence of it automatically means that we are needy for a savior. We might have been born in sin, and our being born in sin means that we are born inclined to have particular affections. But God, when he told Nicodemus in John 3, no one will inherit the kingdom of God unless they are born again. That is ultimately what we need is to be done over. So next week, we're going to talk about the heterosexual gospel and how many of us have confused marriage with gospel preaching. Um, we're going to talk about the difference between conversion and conversion therapy. We're going to talk about um, sanctification in the life of a same-sex attracted believer. And we're going to dig into glorification as our ultimate hope that we will not always be here and we will not always be this way. I'm done, Apostle.